About a decade into the new millennium, and survival horror found itself in a precarious spot. Resident Evil entries had become few and far between, with 5 and 6 proving to be incredibly divisive. Silent Hill was breathing its last with a hat trick of Downpour, the game with the original corn song in it, a shoddy big screen adaptation of Silent Hill 3, and a Vita exclusive roguelike. Smaller franchises had ceased altogether. The fourth Project Zero game went entirely unlocalized until 2023, 15 years after its Japanese release. The writing was seemingly on the wall. Around the world, you could hear the collective sigh of everyone who was holding their breath for Blue Stinger 2. But all was not lost. Thus came the Indies. Swedish studio Frictional Games set the horror world on fire with Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Rather than a gritty hero gunning down zombos, Amnesia puts players in the first-person shoes of academic fancy boy Daniel as he runs from naked goblins and hides in closets while managing his dwindling sanity. Amnesia's success brought about a great survival horror sea change. Soon, digital marketplaces were flush with innovators and imitators, from big-budget licensed tie-ins like Alien Isolation to the bootstrap giallo tributes of Puppet Combo. The through-line of this eclectic selection of games is a protagonist, often from a first-person perspective, pursued by an implacable stalker. In the spirit of this, I've decided to unofficially dub this subgenre Pursuit Horror. Now, Pursuit Horror is particularly interesting and terrifying because it is the opposite of a power fantasy, having more in common with horror cinema than its interactive forebears. The terror at your heels cannot be killed and cannot be stopped. The verbs at your disposal are based on agility and stealth rather than offense. Add some adventure game elements, lock and key puzzles, getting the power back on to turn on the lights or activate an elevator, or good old-fashioned gathering of documents and spooky story beats, and you've got a delightfully tense nightmare on your hands. There's even an observable sub-subgenre within Pursuit Horror, high-octane experiences in which your antagonist is unpredictable, incredibly fast, and incredibly loud. Let's call these games Panic Horror, for the intense panic they seek to evoke from the player. Panic Horror was originally used by Capcom as promo for Dino Crisis, in contrast to Resident Evil Survival Horror, but in this case I'm using it to describe games like Akamanto by Chilla's Art or Night of the Nun by Puppet Combo. These two games in particular have permadeath. Once you're killed, it's back to the title screen, or in the case of Night of the Nun, back to the desktop before you even have a chance to realize what just happened, adding to their deliberate disorientation tactics. Admirable, but admittedly panic horror games are a little much even for a tried-and-true horror connoisseur like me. Oh, I officially hate this. But let's get back on topic. Pursuit Horror breathed new life into the wider horror genre, particularly as streaming began to take off. The squeamish, horror game curious could get their fix by watching their favorite streamer take the reins while enjoying all of the scares filtered through a parasocial buddy. Plus, who doesn't love to watch someone get jump scared on camera? But there's one game in particular I'd like to talk about today. A singular horror game that predated, nay, predicted, the potential of Pursuit Horror way back at the tail end of the 90s. The little twerp. I'll kill her next time. <laughs> no, it's not Clock Tower 2, The Struggle Within. This one is the real shiitake, baby. So back when I was a teenager, every game ever was not available for download at your legally gray fingertips. So getting your hands on weird, obscure games that you read about online required a certain level of resourcefulness and commitment. Searching esoteric eBay auctions to get your hands on stuff like Gakko de Atta Kawai Hanashi S, Gakko no Kaidan, Gakko no Kawai Uasa Hanako-san Gakita, 
and other games with Gakko in the title. Scouring CEX off Rathbone Place, back when they sold imports, drooling over the Hello Kitty Dreamcast you couldn't afford, and buying copies of Witch of Salzburg and RMJ Mystery Hospital for a pound a pop from Charlie Brooker, who'd make fun of your purchases and probably your haircut too. I couldn't care less I couldn't read any Japanese. I cared even less that these games were, quite often, pretty bad. And then, sometime around 2001, I came across Hell Knight. Music, oh my god. One of Hell Knight's strongest assets is a dark ambient supergroup of Rick Hillman, Tomoeda Ryohei, Tanako Minehiko, Wato Naoki, Kitaura Masataka, and Fujita Freakin' Harumi, the former Capcom composer responsible for the iconic tunes of Strider and Ghosts and Goblins. Anyway, it turns out I'd seen Hell Knight before. I'd recognized its pre-rendered bitmap characters and its screen-filling revenant hanging upside down to ambush the player from a 1998 issue of Famitsu I'd once picked up in Chinatown. This was a game known in Japan as Dark Messiah. Its first-person perspective and striking character designs made me think of an even more horrific take on Shin Megami Tensei, but perhaps I was influenced by the little Atlas logo in the corner. Really, I wasn't terribly off-base. Developed by teeny tiny Osaka-based studio Deno Ezo Seisaksho, a good chunk of Hell Knight's team would contribute to the PS1 port of the first SMT before working with Atlas again on the Dreamcast horror RPG Desperia, a beautiful cyberpunk nightmare set in a post-World War III Tokyo ruled by a repressive theocracy. Although also not a Mega Ten game, it would feel right at home in a particularly harrowing branch of the Amala network. Hell Knight is pure pursuit horror. A singular creature chases you through a subterranean maze, and as the game's opening awkwardly reads, the only things you can do is to run away and keep running. While Hell Knight and Mega Ten may not have much in common at first blush, the thematic similarities are there. A vast dungeon populated by weirdos, survival of the fittest in the presence of an otherworldly force of nature. The difference is in scale. A uh, Megaten Devil Summoner has their run of the city, using their gump to bind demons to their will. But what about the rest of us? If one zooms all the way in on an encounter between a demon and an everyday civilian, it might just look a little like Hell Knight. I facetiously mentioned Clock Tower 2 earlier, and uh, although Hell Knight definitely shares characteristics with the wider Clock Tower series, it also has a lot in common with early microcomputer adventure games like Hunt the Wampus, Colossal Cave Adventure, and Zork, but in particular, 3D Monster Maze, developed by Malcolm Evans in 1981 for the Sinclair ZX81. Echoing the myth of Theseus in the Minotaur's Labyrinth, 3D Monster Maze is a relatively simple game in which the player has been banished by a wretched clown to wander a simple maze, all the while being stalked by a T-Rex. Each step awards a single point, as the terrible lizard pursues you in real time while text updates on the creature's position scroll across the bottom of the screen. If you find the exit before the Tyrannosaurus finds you, your reward is to wander concurrent mazes forever in a twist of existential horror. Though perhaps a tad quaint and simplistic by modern standards, 3D Monster Maze is capable of providing a stressful experience to this day. When you try to quit, the game nightmarishly breaks the fourth wall and puts up your request to appeal. Ultimately, a simple RNG coin flip whether the program shuts down or forces you to keep playing. Obviously, you can just try again immediately to end the game, but it's a nice little twist. Eat your heart out, video game creepypastas. There is an observable through line from 3D Monster Maze to Hell Knight and, by extension, to your present-day amnesias and outlasts, although it's difficult to say if Hell Knight was particularly influential. Konami's near-silent European release offered a triple threat of low print run, lack of American release, and surprisingly negative contemporary reviews. 
all of which would severely limit its reach. The English script is littered with typos, and the voice acting, limited as it was, has been carelessly muted, perhaps to avoid paying licensing fees. But even with these issues, Hell Knight happens to be not only one of the PlayStation 1's best-kept secrets, but also one of the best horror games ever made, one that remains woefully underappreciated to this day. It's New Year's Eve, 1999, Tokyo. As the megalopolis begins to herald the new millennium, urban legend tells of the Holy Ring, a doomsday cult supposedly responsible for a rash of mysterious disappearances around the city. On your way home this evening, you learn the Holy Ring isn't just a tall tale. A group of acolytes spot you and give chase. You manage to evade them long enough to run into the subway station and board the last train home. Meanwhile, at the Ministry of Defense complex in Ichigaya, an eldritch goo creature breaks free from its test chamber. As it rises and swallows up a researcher, the two entities merge, becoming a lumbering, lethal zombie in jorts. The creature, hereafter known as the Hybrid, slaughters its way through the lab and ends up on the subway tracks, right in the path of the very train you're on. Stuck in the headlights, the train promptly flattens it, and you go home without incident and enjoy a quiet New Year's Eve at home with some Toshikoshi Soba as you watch Kohaku. Brief, strange, arty, that's the end of Hell Knight. Fiend. No, of course not. Your train is derailed violently, and the seemingly indestructible hybrid boards the wreckage and kills any passenger unlucky enough to be in its way. You grab the hand of a teenage girl struggling to get away, and the two of you escape the wreckage. She introduces herself as Naomi Sugiura, but things only get worse, as you're confronted with a black ops mercenary unit equipped with heavy weaponry. They're here to take down the hybrid, along with any surviving witnesses. As the squad grapples with the hybrid's assault, you have just enough time to run into a sewer access room, in hopes to escape to another part of the city. And this is where Hell Knight begins proper, first showing it's just as much a descendant of the Portopia serial murder case as it is 3D Monster Maze. Indeed, this is partly a Japanese-style adventure game. Trapped in a room between the subway and the sewer system, the hybrid bangs on the door as we look for our egress. We investigate a small selection of hot spots to uncover a compass and a crowbar. In true adventure game fashion, we use the crowbar on the trap door leading to the sewer and make our way into our first maze. The sewers proper. Now, I know what you're thinking. Time from game start to sewer level is colloquially and cheekily used to define the exact point in which the developer's creativity supposedly runs out. A sewer requires very little visual flair, eats up a lot of time with overly long, maze-like layouts, and they usually come ready-built for stock puzzles based around raising and lowering water levels, extending bridges, or unlocking gates. Their layouts naturally allow for unnecessary padding to increase that delicious hour count that gamers seem to prize so highly. In Hell Knight's case, the Tokyo Sewer is literally the inverse of this, a valuable smidge of mundanity here to set the stage for a truly bizarre setting yet to come. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Hell Knight is one of the many first-person PS1 games which, despite releasing after the DualShock pad, didn't use either of the analog sticks. The D-pad controls forward and backward movement, as well as turning from side to side. L1 and R1 strafe left and right, respectively. Holding L2 and using the D-pad allows you to look in all directions while standing in place. And holding down R2 gives you a real delicious look-behind chase camera. It's actually not very useful in a practical sense, but it's a fantastic bit of flavor. Triangle button opens the current floor, filled in as you move, and the square button allows for you to chat with your buddy, Naomi at first, because it wouldn't be a Japanese-style adventure game without a partner. Sometimes they give you a hint on what to do next, but most of the time it's just flavor text, or maybe even some deeper insight into what's going on. If you manage to somehow lose your partner, you only get the chilling message, you're all alone now. 
And finally, holding down the X button lets you sprint, though not indefinitely. Your main verb is evasion, after all. Sprint for too long, your heartbeat starts to echo loudly, the DualShock rumbles in time, and you eventually slow to a crawl as the screen flashes red. An effective simulation of a burgeoning runner's stitch. One of the biggest challenges in Hell Knight is managing your stamina, so you're not caught out of breath at the worst possible time. As we make our way through the drainage tunnels, wading through filth, Naomi stops us. She's had a psychic premonition. The hybrid's hiding behind a corner just up ahead, holding its breath in ambush. Sure enough, it drops from the ceiling, and we find ourselves in our first chase sequence. Naomi, although defenseless, has psychic capabilities which allow you to sometimes, and only sometimes, see the position of the hybrid on the map screen, as long as it's nearby. This is an invaluable tool in safe navigation of Hell Knight's many dark corridors. Get caught by the hybrid, they'll kill and devour your partner first, which gives you roughly a five second head start to get away. Get caught alone, and it's game over. As we escape our first encounter with our bejorted pursuer, we have a few options at our disposal. You can run away and to keep running, or you can hide in what appears to be a metal shipping container at the end of one of the drainage halls. You can open the door, shut it behind you, and then you get this three-quarter camera angle of the hybrid slowly trundling up to the door before slowly turning and walking away. The sound here is absolutely You hear him retreating into the distance and judge when you should come out of hiding. The strangest thing about this sequence is it's the only such occurrence in the entire game. Hiding places never come up again, not once. As we seek a way out, old machinery rooms set the stage for what's ahead. There's pipework flecked with blood, and we end up finding a metal keycard bearing the symbol of the Holy Ring Cult. We solve a couple of Adventure Game 101 puzzles, find a key to open a locked door, and turn off the electricity powering a stray cable that's found its way into the sewage waters. And with that, we climb through a collapsed tunnel to find ourselves entering one of the most exciting and thought-provoking settings across the entire video game's medium. Tokyo Mesh. A subterranean capital constructed to serve as the world's largest nuclear fallout bunker. Abandoned at the time of Japan's surrender in mid-1945, the mesh serves as a home to the downtrodden, criminals and ne'er-do-wells certainly, but also the homeless, the antisocial, the disabled, victims of circumstance, and general misfits. Tokyo Mesh is an incredibly well-populated and detailed locale, and you spend just as much time getting to know its colorful characters as you do evading the hybrid. Hell Knight's manual even contains a surprisingly detailed chronology of the alternate history that led to the Mesh's creation. From the formulation of the plan in 1929 to its subsequent abandonment coinciding with the end of the Great War. This timeline contains plenty of sumptuous flavor which, although much of it doesn't appear in game, really highlights the love the writers had for this setting. Take for example a, a short paragraph on the Sakuratsuka Performing Arts Company and their actions performing propaganda theater at the height of the war, a barely disguised take on the Takarazuka Review, the enduring all-women's musical theater troupe who weebs probably know served as the inspiration for Sakura War's Hanagumi. Within the mise-en-scene of Hell Knight's humongous haunted bomb shelter, we can see the perfect meld of four distinct cultural anxieties. The first, obviously, is the lingering ghost of the end of World War II, and the harsh reality of the nuclear bombardment of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and how Japan is forced to come to terms with the fact that it is the only country on Earth to suffer such a grotesque demonstration of military might. Within the depths of the mesh, we even encounter a handful of aging military officers who never resurfaced, some of whom fully gave in to the delusion that the war is still being fought, for the alternative is just too great a burden to bear. 
Their presence echoes the minuscule number of very real Japanese holdouts who refused surrender and continued to fight their own personal war, in some cases for as long as 30 years. The second is economic anxiety. Following the end of the war, Japan rebuilt itself at a remarkable rate. The country's GDP jumped up nearly 10% during the 1960s and continued to grow, largely unencumbered by the global recession of the 1970s. Consistent economic growth led to the bubble economy of the 1980s, where real estate and stock prices spiked at an all-time high. But the thing about bubbles is they've got to burst eventually, and burst it did at the start of the 90s. Within the blink of an eye, the promise of lifetime employment and ensured promotion within a company were things of the past. Sentiments quickly changed. Being a hard worker no longer came with its rewards. The government, allegedly sworn to protect its civilians, had only let them down. The future was now shaky, uncertain, heralding in a new era of unemployment and homelessness. In Hell Knight's fiction, this is demonstrated by the Mesh's not insubstantial population of residents to whom the shifting economy had been particularly unkind. The third anxiety is a much more recent injury. The 1995 sarin gas attacks, as perpetrated by the doomsday cult Aum Shinrikyo, five coordinated strikes on the Tokyo Metro during rush hour, killing 13 and severely injuring hundreds more. Aum's actions reverberated deeply across Japanese society, and naturally across the country's pop culture landscape, particularly due to the fact that Aum was not a foreign threat, but a domestic group consisting primarily of disillusioned, financially stable intellectuals. These wounds were still incredibly fresh during Hell Knight's development, with the subway derailment that serves as the story's catalyst immediately bringing to mind the tragic events of 1995. The fourth and final anxiety is a little more universal, an uncertain look towards the future and the end of the 20th century. The end of a millennium naturally goes hand in hand with doomsday speculation, not to mention the looming threat of the Y2K bug. If the world isn't going to end, that's even worse. After a prolonged history of pain, what fresh hell would the new century usher in? Even above all of this, anyone who lives in a city with an underground transport system can tell you that using it can be an anxious experience. You're deep beneath the surface. The air is stale, and the crowded rush hour commute is the anoclophobe's worst nightmare. Or there's times when it's empty, deathly still, and there's this uncanny feeling that something unseen is watching you from the darkened tunnels. Involuntary daydreams of accidents, malfunctions with terrible consequences, or even just tripping and falling onto the tracks. The very real threat posed by other people just about every woman I know has a story about a subway creep and different levels of unwanted attention, harassment, or assault. The underground is an appropriate stage for an Arto-esque theater of cruelty of the mind, the mundane turned terrifying, a feeling to which Hell Knight expertly taps in. And the fact that it so deftly taps into all of these very real fears and weaves them into a tale of a scary monster in an underground hall shows us a horror story that is remarkably in touch with the shared unease of its audience. As inflation soars, wages stagnate, and once comfortable positions become ever more precarious, and none of us want to go to work in the post-pandemic era, Hell Knight is just as relevant now as ever. The mesh, or rather the slice of it that we see in Hell Knight, is divided into three distinct floors. They correspond nicely with the game's three-act structure. It's actually closer to three and a half floors, but we'll get to that later. The first act opens as we come in on the first floor, a residential level divided into four intercardinal quadrants. Each time we enter a new area, we're prompted to save our game. Death means a trip back to the title screen, but little progress is lost as long as you save every chance you get. We're welcomed by Razo, a mysterious waif clad in ragged clothes, something of a puckish trickster who encourages us to take some time and see the sights. Before we have time to consider his words, an explosion sounds, and the still functional security systems activate, lowering shutters and blocking our path forward. 
The ultimate goal is to escape the mesh and return to the surface, and naturally, per the genre, your journey will take you further from the light into the deepest, darkest layers of the subterranean capital, and embroil you in the schemes of the sinister figures who forced you down here to begin with. But honestly, with the exception of the killer monster running around, it doesn't seem so bad down here. Okay, it's bad, it's dingy and gross and probably smells like sewage and rot, yet there's an undeniable charm to the mesh in its denizens. It brings to mind the infamous Kowloon Walled City, the long demolished lawless cube of tower blocks that once stood in the midst of Hong Kong and inspired dozens of video games, manga, and movies. While undoubtedly a product of British colonial rule and post-World War II hardships, Kowloon Walled City had a reputation for being an ungovernable hotbed of crime, though it was also a bustling social hub in which neighbors lived in peace, fondly remembered by former residents today, decades after its demolition. The Mesh, too, is largely a community of eccentric neighbors who respect each other and get along. The Mesh has something of a community sheriff, Sweeper Leno. Bald as can be and sporting a spiffy red cape, his main job is that of a citywide administrator, but he also solves disputes and injustices reported to his office. First met in the town square, he tells us about a staircase in the northwest district that may lead back to the surface. With the security system on red alert, the gates separating the four quadrants have locked. They can be opened manually with a gate key, which we don't have. This is our first goal, gain access to the northwest quadrant, and with it, the rest of the floor, with an aim to disable the security system along the way. We begin here in the town square by talking to Strange Sonoda. He tells us that the ghost of a World War II soldier has been visiting him at night, demanding that he find some top secret documents. So we head back out into the quiet halls of the mesh. While there seems to be some sort of lighting down here, the low draw distance makes it feel as though the darkness is ever encroaching, deftly hiding anything that could be lurking in the corners. And something is lurking indeed. The hybrid has followed us, and it's evolved. While he once slowly ambled after us, the gloves and jorts have come off, revealing a Giver-esque revenant, using its newly developed leg muscles to run after us at speed. He can be outrun and even outsmarted. The tunnels of the mesh are more circuitous and complex than the sewer outlet, allowing you to bait him down one corridor and then quickly duck into another. Or you could enter one of the several doors dotting the hallway, many of which reveal empty rooms, but usually reset your pursuer's position, allowing for a quick escape when in a tight spot. However, with the security shutters lowered, one must take care not to get caught at a literal dead end. Each area you visit is jam-packed with interesting things to find, a lot of which are completely optional. One recurring character is Mole the Appraiser of the Tokyo Mesh Fine Arts Appraisal Society. An appreciator of all sorts of objects, he's a friendly face who will give you hints and flavor text about any inventory item you show him. Mole has many outlets across the mesh. How he gets from place to place is anybody's guess, but it's always pleasing to see him, and he's generally able to give you a push in the right direction if you ever feel stumped about what to do next. This is a pretty good opportunity to get some intel on that strange metal card we picked up back in the sewers, which Mole recognizes as an access key for the city's information terminals. Each section of each floor has an information terminal, usually found in proximity to the area's entrance, and denoted by a number on the door. Inside is an old-timey computer. When you slide your card in, it displays a complete map of the current floor with limited hotspots. Due to the living nature of the mesh, this information is very outdated, relating to the city's original function as a bomb shelter, so you won't find out about everything there is down here just from looking at the terminal alone. But this first terminal shows us in the southwest there's a hospice located in the middle of the floor. Why don't we go and check that out? Uh-oh, look who it is. Fortunately, the area surrounding the hospice is a perfect square, so we can get the hybrid to chase us and then circle around back to the door and duck inside. 
And what we find is very disturbing. Body length tables with leather restraints, the room has been in use up until very recently. If we poke around, we can find an old project log which details the excavation of areas 13 and 15. The plan met with tragedy when multiple cave-ins took the life of several workers. Their autopsy reports show diseased and mutated tissue, and we can also read medical documents about strange organisms with fish-like scales and arthropod characteristics, along with a number of inhuman x-rays. The final few pages of the log express the need for help from Central Command, but they end abruptly, ominously, without resolution. Just what was going on down here? Finally, in the southwest corner of the map, we meet Sergeant Okabe, an aged and quite deranged military man who believes World War II is still being fought. He entrusts us with his secret documents. We remember where to take these, right? We hand them over to Tsunoda, but he doesn't seem to be speaking to us. His concentration is focused behind our shoulder, at a phantom soldier who only Tsunoda seems to be able to see. Well, no matter. He rewards us with the gate key, finally allowing us into the Northwest District. Before long, we reach the staircase that Leno mentioned. But when we approach, Naomi's sixth sense goes haywire, and she pleads with us to turn around and run away from the stairs as fast as possible. It's probably best to listen to Naomi, but you can ignore her and attempt to ascend to the surface. And if you do, You awake to find that Razo dragged you away from the stairs and out of danger. He warns you the stairway is the prime hunting ground of the Holy Ring cult. They take delight in using it as a hope spot for those who wish to leave before ambushing and absconding with them. He advises you to forget about Naomi and work only for yourself. If you decide not to heed Razo's warning and head back to the stairway alone, So, let's say you screwed up and you lost Naomi, you monster. Fortunately, there's four other partners for you to buddy up with. I'll touch on each of them when they appear. All of these partners come equipped with firearms. Hitting the talk button when right next to the hybrid will trigger an FMV where they fire off a shot, stunning the creature and allowing you a short window of time to pass by and escape. Naturally, this cannot be used infinitely. Each character has a different amount of ammo, and once they run out, that's it. Guns should only ever be used as a last resort, but Hell Knight, with a few late-game exceptions, tends to play pretty fair with its escape routes. After all, you have to finish the game with Naomi in tow to get the best ending, which means no guns. Anyway, the stairs are a no-go, so our revised goal is to reach the southeast stairs, which lead down. But that's okay, there's probably another way up eventually, right? We explore the rest of the first floor, hearing rumors of a serial killer lurking about. 
hiding in the mesh after killing a cop above ground. There's a number of drunks in the Northwest signaling the presence of a bar. Little Jamaica, also a bootlegging operation, as well as a buzzing portrait of humanity beneath the surface. Inside, we meet Kyoji Kamiya, a handsome, amoral creep. He's the serial killer we've been hearing about. He's, uh, he's kind of dressed like Paddington Bear, isn't he? Kyoji sidles on up and stares at us. He claims to notice a familiar glint in your eye. You are not his prey. Completely irredeemable and quite terrifying, Kyoji happens to be the second partner we meet. If you're with Naomi, he'll freak her out a bit before wandering off into the mesh to cause trouble. But if you're alone, he eagerly joins up expressing a supernatural sense of home within the mesh, one that goes far beyond an obligation to hide from the police. Kyoji comes equipped with a handgun, and sometimes you'll run into people whom he wants to kill. You can choose to stop him or let him go ahead, like with poor Maruho here. Kyoji says he harvests his fear and feels it jump inside him like a little black rat. Whether or not you allow Kyoji to exercise his favorite hobby, he can fire his gun to stun the hybrid 18 times, the greatest number of opportunities of all partners, making him the easiest partner with whom to reach the ending. However, it may not be the happiest outcome. Whether we're with Naomi or Kyoji, or alone, we pick up a bottle of bootleg vodka from the pubmaster and head back out into the halls. The Northeast Quad introduces floor hazards, the first of which are these roller conveyor belts. They don't function as you may think, they're switched off and you just kind of slide across them. You only have momentum in the direction that you're moving, which limits your evasive maneuvers, but it's ultimately not too much of a problem. Here's the security room. Unfortunately, the door is locked, but... We meet a pair of goobers who are both looking for a pair of headphones. Valley girl Natural Mika wants to listen to her jams, while Sugiya wants to listen to the voice of his deceased father. A circuitous route back to the Southwest Quad earns us a pair of broken headphones. At this point, it's up to you which lucky weirdo gets the prize. Sugiya's the closest option, and well, I guess he gets the most out of them. Giving them to Mika requires quite a bit of backtracking, but ultimately shortens a big chunk of Act 2. Both paths take roughly the same amount of time, and both of them reward you with the key to the southeast stairs, so ultimately it's a matter of player preference. We find Pheromone Mayumi, a lush who asks for a bottle of vodka before she dries out completely. She rewards us with a green card, the key to the security control room. We evade the hybrid, get into the previously locked control room, and we can push a single red button to relax the security restrictions across the first floor. This unlocks every shutter across the four quadrants, allowing greater egress as well as access to previously inaccessible areas and rooms. Most importantly, it unlocks the gate blocking the door to the southeast stairs. We can head straight there to enter the second act, or... We can go back to previous areas and see what else is out there, or even check up on old friends, where we see a series of brutal murders have occurred. This isn't Kamiya's MO. These are brutal, animalistic acts of violence. The hybrid, most likely. But back to business. It's time to descend to the second floor and enter the second act. This is where things kick into high gear and Hell Knight truly comes into its own. The second floor is also split into four quadrants, 
Whereas each block of the first floor were cohesive Spartan hallways, this floor begins to play with contrasting spaces, each a temperamental mix of tight claustrophobic corridors and wide-open swaths of inky darkness. We descend the stairs into the residential district, a repurposed workers' corridors with minimal lighting and a disquieting chain-link ceiling. Almost immediately, the hybrid jumps down behind us. It has clearly evolved further and takes off after us in an effortless sprint, footsteps silent but with excited breathing. The corridors widen and it's somehow worse. Every corner darkens and your pursuer has a tendency to jump down right in front of you. It's easy enough to ask Kamiya to pop off around, but if you're with Naomi or alone, you'll have to kite him around one of these pillars. Now, speaking of partners, if you lost Naomi at the Northwest Stairs, you can actually find her bunking up with Makihara here. If you come in with Kamiya in tow, she'll scream at you in fear and then you'll never see her again. But if you come in alone, she rejoins the party. All right. But she's different. Inappropriately flirty, Sometimes she says weird, violent things. You get hints that Naomi isn't all she appears to be if you stick with her from the start, but it's when she rejoins that you start getting your earliest glimpse into somebody who's just as twisted as the rest of the mesh. We meet Reese, the Treasure King, a thief, a magpie, who steals anything that isn't nailed down, and many things that are, out of a sort of cargo con- <laughs> Oh, that's not right at all. Out of a sort of cargo cult mentality, his prized possession is a differential switchboard for an elevator, which he stole from somebody named Tetsuo. He's merely flavor if we helped out Sugiya, but if we helped out Mika, he'll give us the switchboard outright. At the northwest end of this district, we find the central corridor, a tiny cylindrical room dominated by a large mailbox-esque device. More of a rotating panopticon than an elevator, it requires the insertion of a punch card to activate. The first punch card we find in the residential area is for the Livestock District. With its grid of dark, empty pens, the Livestock District is the most suspenseful and stressful area we've traversed yet. The tone is immediately set with the appearance of Miku, a small child holding a stuffed bear named Biki. Though she seems timid, Miku uses Biki as a mouthpiece to give us some good news. We're gonna die down here. Your partner will comment about how it would be impossible to raise livestock in a place like the Mesh. Surely the minds behind this project would know that, right? Or was there something more sinister at play? The pursuit of irrational logic in the face of the unknowable. The hybrid prowls this district aggressively, and while the grid layout allows for multiple avenues of escape, it's not uncommon to round a corner just to come face to face with your pursuer. On these lower, more isolated floors, we start coming across Holy Ring Acolytes. This one, Murami, makes us take a three-question quiz. The questions and their answers are all fairly obscure and ominous, but each question only has two possible answers, and you can retake it as many times as you need. Once you've proven yourself to Murami, they reward you with the sighing flute, a little wind instrument with a horrid face on it that makes a disgusting sound when blown. Razo's down here too, cryptic as ever, telling us we'll never go home. Kamiya can tell there's something up with him, and perceives him to be more than what he appears. But finally, we find Leno again. His office is located in the southeast corner, and he offers to help us get around if we track down Kojima and Miyake, two thieves. He deputizes us and gives us the punch card to the research area. A deft combination of tight corridors over pits that extend deep into the dark, 
The research area is a multi-floor district where the hybrid once again aggressively chases. Upper and lower paths cross over each other, and it's not uncommon to see the hybrid sprinting by on another floor, on its way to your location. We see more floor hazards here. The western area has an icy floor in which it's difficult to maintain motor control, although it doesn't really read as ice, so it's difficult to get the measure of what's going on. In an old supply room, we run into Leroy Ivanov, Russian military man, a bit of a Dolph Lundgren or Arnold-esque action hero. We met him before, though, if you remember. Way back at the beginning of the game, he was part of the Black Ops unit who nearly ventilated us before we escaped into the sewer. He's lighting up the hybrid with some heavy firepower here, avenging his slain comrades. He manages to drive the monster off and turns to us for a quick chat. Ivanov is the third partner character, and he seems to know quite a bit about the hybrid and how it came to be, noting that the very existence of Tokyo Mesh alludes to an unknowable darkness. He joins up if we're alone, sporting a rocket launcher with 12 shots. Despite the higher caliber firepower, the effect on the hybrid is identical to Kamiya's pistol. And the same goes for any other partner. Otherwise, he leaves after wishing us good luck. He recognizes Kamiya as a psychopath, likening him to some of his fellow squad mates. Kamiya, in turn, recognizes him as having the same eyes as a cop crawling in blood looking up at me. That's pretty metal. Before we leave, there's a conspicuous box with moaning inside of it here. If we blow the sighing flute, Miyake pops out. Leno shows up and drags him away, asking us to come back to his office for our first reward. It's honestly a little sinister, as Miyake's never seen again. When we return to Leno, he rewards us with the red card. This allows us to turn off the security system in the research area. This will unlock a shutter that was hiding an elevator, supposedly capable of taking us back to the surface. Regrettably, its switchboard is missing. Now what happens next depends on who you helped earlier. If you helped Mika, we mentioned that Reese rewarded you with the switchboard. You can just plug that bad boy in and away you go. Leno be damned, he can find Kojima himself. But if you helped out Sugiya, we need to seek out old man Tetsuo. He hangs out in the factory area, but Leno's holding the punch card. He'll give it to us if we find Kojima, who may be hiding out with an old girlfriend. Back in the residential district, Makihara is very insistent that we don't touch her dresser. So if we open it up with our crowbar, Kojima spills out. She urges him to run, but Leno shows up. Makihara is absolutely beside herself after this. Just like Miyake, we never see Kojima again. What's Leno doing to these guys? And what does the nickname Sweeper mean anyway? I guess ACAB also includes Leno. He thanks us for enabling whatever awful punishment he's doling out and rewards us with the factory area card. The factory district is another stressful circuit filled with traps. Active conveyor belts create one-way corridors with split-second off-ramps to perpendicular hallways, and there's even some sort of landmines that temporarily blind you and slow your movement to a crawl. Hybrid ambushes are frequent. It's a quadrant which, keeping with the rest of the floor, is just plain nasty. Here's a blood trail leading to a mysterious barred door, also covered in blood. That's probably not good. Ivanov comments, They were going to relocate everything underground. Two bad things didn't work out as planned. Wait, Ivanov. 
Are you lamenting the lack of a nuclear holocaust? Tetsuo can be found in the center of the district and offers to repair the elevator if we helped out Sugia earlier. We can head straight back to research now, but there's more curiosities to find. Another violently desecrated corpse, bummer, and Tsutao, a soulful DJ without a sound system. He stole a CD-ROM from some cultists and gives it to us. Uh, apparently there's no music on it, so it's of no interest to him. We can also check back in with all the friends we made on this floor, just like we did at the end of Act 1. Many of them are dying or dead, ripped apart following an unlucky encounter with the hybrid. Not even Leno is safe. But no matter what, we head back to the elevator, our next hope spot. We press the button for the surface, but just as we begin to ascend, the wire snaps and we're sent plummeting even further into the depths. And here we are, in the basement's basement's basement. The third floor is smaller than the previous two, and doesn't quite signal the start of the third act just yet. Fortunately, not too hurt from the fall, we start to regain our bearings. But before we can hardly take a step, we encounter a holy ring member. The deepest reaches of the mesh, this entire level is completely under their control. The cultist tells us that we, and the prey we're with, will be fed to someone, or something, called the Prince. But before he lays a hand on us, he's ambushed and knocked out by René Lorraine, a journalist with spaghetti hair and a noticeable French accent. Or, if you're with Kamiya, he'll just shoot the cultist in the face before spotting René spying on you from the shadows. René claims to be an underground photojournalist for a publication called DES. What the heck does that stand for? Oh. If you're with Ivanov, René clocks him as being part of the multinational PMC Organ, known to have an uncanny knack for showing up during weird events to pull the rug over things. René knows the Holy Ring are planning an event called the Ceremony of Awakening, and believes that many of them have already left for the Great Hall on a train. As you may have guessed, she's our fourth possible companion. She comes equipped with a submachine gun with a scant five shots. An adventurous sort keen to escape her troubled upbringing, she's been on the outs with her family since she ran away as a teenager. No matter who our partner is, the hybrid falls down from the ceiling. It's transformed again, growing into something much louder, faster, and destructive. Some awkward event flagging here allows you to see the proverbial strings as the hybrid just teleports in right in front of you. While it can be tempting to fire off a shot if you're with an armed partner, playing with Naomi teaches you the importance of evasion techniques. You'll want to save your bullets for the final act, or you'll want to save Naomi's and your own skin. The acolytes down here are really excited for the ceremony. We meet a cultist named Kiyama who expresses worry for us and wants to help us escape. He knows the cult are planning to sacrifice us as the main event of the ceremony, hoping to bring about a cataclysmic event called the Great Union. Kiyama tells us to seek the elevator in the Great Hall. It's an express line to the surface, primarily used for abductions. He gives us the blue card to disable the security systems on this floor. Depending on who you're partnered with, this can shake out slightly differently. Kamiya will do what Kamiya does, shoot him in the face and loot the card off his corpse. When I partnered with Ivanov, Kiyama didn't have the card, and I had to seek true believer Koseki elsewhere on the floor and express my praise for the Dark Messiah to get the card. Look at this Yahweh bit! So much for free speech. There's another delusional World War II soldier down here, Kajiwara. 
It suggested that he might be the ghost who bothered Sonoda for the secret documents all the way back in the town square. Not so much a ghost as a corporeal phantom of bygone sentiments. The security system on this floor is located in some kind of command center, filled with maps and surprisingly new computers. If we picked up that CD-ROM from Tsutao earlier, we can pop it into one of the machines here. This optional bit shows us the Ori Halcyon system, a list of high-ranking Holy Ring acolytes. It's a nice touch, if not slight. After shutting down the security systems, we make our way to an underground train station. The train to the Great Hall arrives, and we surreptitiously get on board alongside Renee. Now, if Renee is our current partner, she leaves the party temporarily here, stating she wants to check on something alone. We can just progress the plot by heading to the right, or we can head to the left and descend to the fourth floor, the minuscule isolated zone. Highly technical, the centerpiece here is the Amaterasu reactor, a giant nuclear fusion device supposedly completed in 1944, but boasting technical capabilities far beyond what was possible to achieve during that point in history. It's certainly mysterious, but all we can really do is check it out. The other doors on this floor are locked. If we head to the right instead, we get to spy on the ceremony of awakening through a crack in the wall. The officiating priest looks wild, inhuman, a hunched creature with an elongated face and arms longer than the rest of its body. Before long, he spots us, staring us right in the eye through the wall. Here we can see he's definitely not human, with a distended backside like a centipede's, with human limbs where its legs should be. It undulates wildly as he sends the cultists after us. Renee jumps down from the shadows and starts gunning them down with pinpoint accuracy. It seems she's a bit more than just a journalist. The hybrid jumps down, transformed once more, positively gigantic. The priest triggers an explosion, but ends up crushed by a falling boulder. The floors collapse and we're sent tumbling ever further downward into the abyss. We're guided to the hive by a spiritual vision of Razo. Definitely more than meets the eye, he welcomes us to a realm beyond our reasoning where the laws of physics are meaningless. He encourages us to keep running. Of course, it's quite possible you got Renee killed earlier on the third floor before she left to explore the Great Hall on her own. And this is Hell Knight we're talking about, so the game actually accounts for this. If Renee isn't there to save the day, Razo appears before us and leads us down to the fourth floor to the back of the reactor. The door we enter warps and takes us to the hive with the same cutscene as normal. While the end result is the same, the extra flagging in detail, specifically an actual reason to visit the mysterious fourth floor, is admirable. We find ourselves in the third and final act, the hive. A Lovecraftian, non-Euclidean hell of fleshy walls and alien architecture. 
honestly, this is where Hell Knight kind of starts to lose steam. The true star here was the mesh itself, and observing how its weird and wonderful denizens built lives for themselves. The Hive and its unknowable inhabitants are certainly a viable turn into cosmic horror, but one can really feel the absence of a truly special setting. Furthermore, latecomer partners like Ivanov and Renee aren't really able to take part in as many interactions as Naomi and Kamiya, and subsequently don't get as much of a chance to shine as the former two. The first and second floors are the absolute best of what Hell Knight has to offer, and this endgame offers little comparison. But back to the Hive itself. As we make our way down its eldritch halls, we encounter the hybrid in combat with another alien being, that which wanders, a Giver-esque entity which drives the beast off with its own combat prowess. A former worker unit, that which wanders has broken off from the rest of the hive and recognizes us as having the same blood as the hybrid, known down here as the Prince or the Dark Messiah. They heard about us from a creature called That Which Leads and encourages us to seek the altar at the center of the hive. That Which Wanders is our fifth and final partner. With no need for firearms, they're capable of generating an energy blast to stun the hybrid, something they can do eight times. To reach the altar, we need to find a series of nexus stones, multicolored orbs which power a teleportation device. This is ultimately a giant fetch quest, not unlike what we've been through so far, but without the mesh's lovable weirdos to talk to, there's very few characters and events to break up the monotony. This is a dungeon crawl through and through, with tongue-like conveyor belts, paralyzing gas traps, and an over-reliance on teleporter mazes. There's still some strong moments along the way. That which feeds asks us to share our revulsion, and, if we accept, sticks a tongue-like appendage in our ear. We get a graphic description of being overwhelmed with parasitic insects. Later, we meet that which quivers, which asks us to share our joy. In a mirror to the revulsion experienced by that which feeds, we feel a moment of pure bliss, sun on our skin, our loved ones happy surrounding us. That which quivers is horrified by these feelings, demanding to know what we did to it before insisting we leave and never return. After navigating a few fleshy mazes and finding a few orbs, we find ourselves faced with a biomechanical terminal. With a single touch, it activates. Intense pain shoots through your body as you undergo the indescribable feeling of being compressed, converted into blocks of data for cataloging within the Hive's data storage server. Separated from our partner, the digital realm buzzes with circuitry and data flows. We've reached a temporary reprieve from the hybrid. Instead, we meet that which divides, a system administrator of sorts. Somehow, the being recognizes us as a great old one, and informs us that the recently assimilated prey has grown restless. We're granted minimal security access and tasked with tracking down an anomaly within the server. Surely this must be some sort of administrative error, right? It's one that certainly works to our advantage, and it would be foolish to correct that which divides. So we set off, under the auspices of fulfilling that request, as we seek out our partner and a way back to the corporeal world. The data storage server is punctuated with nodes in which we can find the digitized souls of those killed by the hybrid. We meet a spirit named Mihail who is quickly losing their mind. They ask if they can upload their consciousness into us so we can escape together. We accept, and we're overcome with tremors as Mihail merges with us. Making our way around, we find individuals who describe the feeling of human data compression to be several magnitudes more painful than dying. 
Toru here tells us that if we get our hands on a bioelectrical matrix, we can help anybody suffering compression. Ultimately, we're going to need that matrix to decompress our partner and escape. The spirit of Razo, or a projection anyway, appears before us. He says he's come to help, but then he says he's just kidding. But ultimately he does help. He imparts his own bioelectric matrix onto us. Not only capable of decompressing souls, it also convinces that which divides to give us higher access credentials. But why is Razo doing this? He describes us as a horse drawing a carriage, or a carrier pigeon, but with the unique choice not to deliver our cargo. With the Matrix in hand, or in head, there's a few optional acts of kindness you can carry out. Across the map are a couple of crystallized forms begging for help. One of them turns out to be... Sweeper Leno! Honestly, he seems a little lackadaisical about his own demise, bemused at worst, and very thankful you took the time to decompress him. I guess once you're dead, how else would you feel? The other compressed form is Harasho, a Holy Ring member who's furious you've released him from his exquisite pain, Cenobite style. With Razo's digital profile transposed onto our body, that which divides, as well as the hive itself, is thrown into confusion. They cannot decide if we are prey or predator. A final verdict is being sought from that which judges, but we are nonetheless granted high-level access in the interim. It's around this time we start to hear about that which leads, a hive unit gifted with autonomous thought and bestowed the form of prey. I wonder if we've met anybody who could match that description. In the far edges of the server, we find our partner within the ancient memory sector. We decompress them before encountering the ancient memory itself. It praises us for getting this far and tells us we're destined to be the new prince. Evidently, when the Hive crash landed on Earth several millennia ago, the prince was shattered into pieces, his essence scattered across the world. It seems the largest share of the prince rests within our protagonist, for whatever reason. Dumb luck, I guess. The ancient memory will await us at the altar, and they give us full access to that which reveals, a data-keeping being who functions as a bit of a lore codex. At the same time... The hybrid is digitized and unleashed, flashing with all the colors of the rainbow and making a beeline for our destination. We can go get that sweet lore, or we can just escape by reaching the hybrid spawn point without running into it. The absolute confidence of burying your lore like this, it's almost discouraged to get it at all. I won't go through every little bit here, but the most important revelations are that the Prince was essentially the navigator for the Hive's ship, and the Holy Ring acolytes had their minds adjusted by the Hive's actors. A sort of biological brainwashing. The Priest itself was never a human, but always a being of the Hive, which explains its monstrous appearance. The biggest issue with this server sequence is how long it is. Since you can only save when entering an area, if you screw up at this last hurdle, your most recent save will be at the start of this absolutely massive fetch quest. Saving has always been one of Hell Knight's bigger issues, but it's pretty egregious here. But we make our escape back into the real world, with assistance from that which judges, a giant, multi-armed, crawfish old one. Hey, Borscht. They've decided to let us roam freely to do what we must, and bestow upon us the final Nexus Stone. We're back outside the subway train, on the tracks. What happened? The tracks stretch onward before us, but seem to lead nowhere. A door on the side of the tunnel takes us back to the sewers. Are we back? Are we nearing the surface? Something seems amiss. If we turn around and attempt to go back to the tracks, we find the same sewer on the other side of the door. Naomi appears before us and encourages us to find the stairs, even if she's dead, at which point her form dissipates into the ether. 
Checking the map reveals the area's true name, the Conversion Room. We see a second horror genre shift here, from the Lovecraftian into the psychological. This is an illusionary struggle session intended to break your will, weaponizing the neuroses of anyone unfortunate enough to find themselves forced into this chamber. Well, our hero is something of a blank slate, so instead you learn about your partner's neuroses, fears, and personal histories. Stock archive screams echo through the halls. Too goofy to be scary, Samples is recognizable and silly as the Wilhelm scream. This is the exposition chamber. The hybrid is not here to menace us, despite the occasional sound of his breathing. Many of the hallways stretch out infinitely, but we find a series of doors, and behind these doors are our current partner's deepest, darkest memories. These are mostly pretty cool. I won't go through all of them, uh, but I'll touch on some of my favorites. Let's start with Naomi. If you've conversed with her regularly up to this point, she may have told you about her childhood friends Toshia and Atsuko, and expressed regret at what happened to them. While unclear, it sounds like Naomi may have killed them. Here's Naomi's family kitchen, inhabited by a shadow of her mother. She's distressed that Naomi came home. She says she doesn't want a violent murderer in the house. What's most curious about the conversion room is the final door that you come to. If you've checked all of your partner's memories leading up to it, you meet that which whispers, which commends you for seeing through their illusions before bestowing the final nexus stone and teleporting you to the altar, telling you that they look forward to tasting your fear. But if you go there before seeing the other doors, you see your partner's most revealing delusion of all. Just like the codex in the data server, this really requires you to go out of your way to get it. But in this case, its magnitude's more important. In Naomi's case, we see a flashback of her at school, her best friend turning her back on her because she's too weird. Kamiya, being a serial killer, has some of the darker delusions. A former lover, Sayaka, who pities his continued hunger, and expresses a wish that he killed her to sate his appetite permanently. This appears to rattle him greatly. Here's the screaming, red-eyed apparition of the police officer Kamiya killed, laughingly tells him that he's already in prison in the hive with no chance of escape. Kamiya's final door is quite distressing. His first kill was a small kitten, which has haunted him ever since. He's constantly followed by oral hallucinations of pitiful mewling, which you may have picked up if you talk to him regularly in the hallways. The kitten appears, and he says that he's happy to have finally found it, and they hope that they're together soon. Ivanov's delusions are centered around his squad, many of whom died fighting the hybrid during the opening. Jackson here, face twisted in agony, describes in graphic detail what it felt like to have his skull smashed open and his brains eaten, all while he was alive. This is Danny, a soldier who studied psychology. He recounts how Ivanov's squad carried out a black ops mission in the dissolved West African state of Biafra. Ivanov killed a commando who was protecting his own daughter, Kima, who he then adopted as his own. Danny says Ivanov believes he can only atone for his deeds by throwing himself into increasingly suicidal missions. Ivanov's final door shows us Kima herself. She states that behind the sorrowful look on his face, the eyes of a ruthless killer pierce everyone they look at. Renee has some of the sillier delusions. That's not to say they're bad, they're plenty entertaining, but they feel like they're from a different game. Like they're on loan from D. Laura, go back. The family she left behind, the Lorraines, are an old aristocratic bloodline with a history of dark rituals and devil summoning. 
Here's Bernard, her hoity-toity childhood friend to whom she was arranged to be wed. She quickly realizes that this is a vision plucked from her memories by the hive, describing him as a fancy little daddy's boy incapable of going pee-pee on his own. She comments he was much uglier in real life. Daryl, a former co-worker and casual lover, accuses Renee of sleeping her way to the top. In turn, she accuses him of sexual impropriety with his young assistant, suggesting this may have been their own relationship. Daryl commends Renee on getting the scoop of the century, but laughs as she will die in the abyss. Finally, we see Lord Lorraine, Renee's abusive, occult-minded father. A disembodied Dracula head floating in what looks like a community center cafeteria. He pities Renee's hold on her own humanity. She in turn says she became an occult journalist to expose his pursuits as mere fantasy. That which wanders, being unknowable, has some of the weaker delusions. Namely, other members of the Hyde chiding him for going against them as he strengthens his resolve to destroy them all for good. Pretty great psychedelic visuals here, but a character like this isn't really capable of having a compelling backstory. Mostly just old ones complaining about the youth of today. This old one says that which wanders will be banished to wander in nothingness once the hive awakens, but he looks like a member of Daft Punk with ample bosoms. That which wanders final door reveals the dark messiah himself, attempting to tempt him back saying that if he rejoins the Hive, he can take over as that which leads. This gives him pause, but the two of you move on. Now, the toughest set of delusions to acquire are the ones you see if you're alone. This requires you to enter the data server without a partner, meaning whoever you're with has to kick the bucket after you meet that which wanders at the start of the Hive. I was curious to see what they'd do here, I mentioned that the protagonist is very much a blank slate, but one with some set facts. He's a male, he was a quote-unquote normal adult with a job, and he contains the biggest shard of the prince's will within him. However, we don't actually see any of our own history, and instead see visions of our fallen comrades urging us to give up and accept our fate. This includes a cruel, mocking version of Razo, who's revealed to actually be that which leads and states that he's been manipulating you from the start. While this isn't wrong, from what we know of the conversion room, this is likely not the true Razo, but just another of that which whispers tricks. Anyway, we escape the conversion room with assistance from that which whispers, and find ourselves at the altar at the very center of the hive. Razo appears before us once more, in his corporeal form for the first time since entering the Hive. He leaves us with a few ponderous questions. Why we're here, and if we want to go back to our lives, or lose everything. No matter what we decide, he says he's rooting for us. We walk down a long corridor through these gross little anus doors, and at the end we're welcomed by the High Council of Old Ones. They explain that the Hive crash-landed on our planet, possibly millions of years ago, before life itself existed. They lay dormant until humanity, their prey, evolved. The shattered essence of the Prince swept over the planet, and they've been seeking his pieces since their first arrival. And if we're with Kamiya, that's the end of the game. He recognizes the Black Beast that urges him to kill as a voice born from the Hive. With this revelation, he embraces the end of his own life as long as he can take everything else with him. He approaches the hybrid and ascends, merging with it, suggesting that our presence also sees us merged. We see a brief glimpse of all life on Earth being snuffed out. Uh, 
Otherwise, we have a brief discussion with the hybrid himself. All of our other partners contain a piece of the prince's essence, and, as such, each of them were subconsciously called down here. Naomi, for example, isn't exactly psychic. Her ability to sense the hybrid on the map is due to her innate ability to recognize the presence of her kin. Now, some of the sequence doesn't actually make a lot of sense. The prince appears to be in this massive cylinder, waiting for our arrival to revive him. But aren't the prince and the hybrid that's been chasing us one and the same? When and why did he get in the tube? Maybe after eating enough souls and harvesting their essence, he's in the tube awaiting his final meal? I don't know, probably best not to overthink what's meant to be an evocative set piece. But it's hard not to, as Hell Knight has paid such careful attention to its world building up to this point. Razo, or rather that which leads, laughs ruefully. The prince's gambit has failed. Humanity has beaten him against all odds. He teleports us to the altar's reactor tunnels to destroy the hive once and for all. Oh boy, this is tough. Split into four areas, the altar is a single map rotated to make four different layouts. It's filled with blind corners, tight corridors, and one-way conveyor belts. The hybrid teleports all over the place, sometimes at will, sometimes based on floor triggers. Our goal is to find a generator at the center of each map, where we cause destruction by throwing each of the Nexus Stones in. Although the map is rotated, the layout is the same for all four areas, so you can use the same pathfinding to get through. The trouble is, there's no saving in between these maps, so you have to do the entire altar in a single attempt. There's so many gotcha moments with the hybrid which differ from map to map, and the final area has a seemingly impassable encounter with him. Better hope you have some bullets left, or at least a partner to cushion your blow. For years, years, I simply could not do this with Naomi. I tried so many times, and I just couldn't find a way past the hybrid to the final altar. Seriously, what gives, Hell Knight? Well, as I was recording footage for this video, I found something. If you are very lucky, and the game never hints that this is possible, Naomi can stun the hybrid at the altar by shouting, I wish you were dead, and firing an energy beam at him. This is a requirement to complete the game with Naomi alive. So shame on you if you didn't know, I guess? With the disposal of the final stone, all of the old ones drop dead and the hive begins instant fossilization. Razo tells us to get on the elevator behind the altar and says he'll get out on his own volition. We board the elevator and see the Amaterasu reactor from the fourth floor fall into the hive, blowing up like Neo Tokyo at the start of Akira. Blast doors seal the elevator shaft, protecting us on our way up. And now you get your ending. And endings are not Hell Knight's strong suit. Depending on who you're with, you get a variation on one of two endings. Firstly, there's the bad ending, achieved if you destroy the hive alone or accompanied by that which wanders. The credits roll over sinister music and that's it, nada. Thanks for playing. Try again next game. Then there's the good ending. Whether you're with Naomi, Ivanov, or Renee, the ending cutscene is always the same, but with dialogue from your respective partner. You and your partner emerge from the darkness onto a pastoral, abandoned military base as the sun shines high above. The new millennium has dawned, and you've survived. Soon, black helicopters appear ominously overhead, and the credits roll. Uh-oh! 
And it seems kinda ambiguous and bleak, like you're gonna get rubbed out by Black Ops. Unless you finish with Ivanov, in which case it's strongly suggested that this is the rest of his organ crew here to investigate the aftermath and pick you up and take you to safety. Renee's dialogue appears to take place long after the ending montage, as she wistfully muses that all of her photos ended up overexposed and unusable, leaving her with no proof of what happened in the mesh. She seemingly lost touch with you after the events of that night, and wonders if you were able to overcome your trauma and return to a normal life. Finally, there's Naomi's ending, the most difficult to achieve with no room for error from start to finish. She encourages you to head home, remarking that nobody will believe the night you both had. Roll credits. That's it. And it stinks! Kamiya's ending might be the most compelling. Bleak, catastrophic, and with its own unique cutscene to boot. Bonus, you don't have to go through the altar, which really is more trouble than it's worth. It's hard to determine what happened with these endings. Either Deno Azo ran out of development time, or they just didn't know how to effectively wrap up the story. Could be one or the other, or even both. There's certainly evidence that Hell Knight may have been more ambitious than what ended up in the finished game. Take into consideration the small number of alternative solutions. The ability to hide in that container room way back in the sewer, the branching path with the headphones, these, in addition to Hell Knight's staggering number of optional rooms and NPC interactions, suggest a desire for experimentation that ultimately wasn't able to reach its full potential. I find it hard to believe a game with such attention to detail and world building would wrap on such a non-ending unless Deno Azo had no other choice but to finish up in a hurry. I'd love to know more about this game's development, but it's obscure even by Japanese standards, making it hard to find out much more about it. There's virtually no interviews, post-mortems, or retrospectives to speak of, while many of Hell Knight's creative leads quietly disappeared after Deno Ezo shuttered in the early 2000s. But not before releasing the equally breathtaking and obscure Dispiria, which we mentioned at the top of this video. I did learn that Kajino Jun, one of the environmental artists responsible for the mesh's unforgettable sense of place, founded the Osaka-based architectural rendering firm Inkar in 2012, so he's still coming up with striking structural designs to this day. There's a multi-part interview with him on the architectural website KViz, in which he talks about dropping out of college and working at Deno Ezo, where he first learned to use a computer. The interview is entirely in Japanese, though, but I'll drop a link in the description. Even the most beloved horror games tend to struggle with their conclusions. Hell Knight's second act, with its haunting industrial spaces and unique encounters, is a real tough one to follow. And that's okay. Why dwell on what could have been when we can appreciate what is? And what is is, frankly, fantastic. Hell Knight remains an incredibly unique and memorable entry in the broader world of horror games. There is something that feels very cursed about its flat, pre-rendered character bitmaps popping up against the 3D background, resulting in an aesthetic that manages to simultaneously be lo-fi and visually striking. Tokyo Mesh ranks among the finest and most original settings in all of video games, its dropout denizens lovable and compelling. It's chock full of quiet moments in which you simply visit these weirdos in their homes, oftentimes for no other reason than just the sake of it. One may argue that the rapid interlinking of the high octane with the downtime leads to a dissonant experience, but it's probably my favorite thing about it. And, of course, the implacable hybrid, unstoppable, unrelenting in its pursuit of you, unknowable, incapable of reason, evolving into a bigger threat every time you think you've managed to evade it. The only thing you can do is to run away and to keep running. A part of me will always be down there, in the bowels of the mesh, forever running, running, running. Each time I play Hell Knight, I manage to see at least one new thing I'd never encountered before, and to me, that's the mark of a true masterpiece.
Denoezo's tale is a bittersweet one. A studio who produced a small library of incredible shit before vanishing into the ether forevermore. But we need not mourn them. Their influence lives on in the hearts and minds of those who experience their games, particularly those who grew up to create games and cultivate the ongoing lo-fi indie horror boom. Thank you for watching, folks. I really hope you enjoyed this one. Um, if you did, it would help me out if you liked and subscribed. It would feed both the algorithm and my ego and help motivate me to continue making videos about the weird and wonderful and sometimes lousy video games that take up too much space in my head. Uh, you can follow me over at Kofi, which I'd really appreciate. You can leave me a tip if you really want to, but that's not required. Um, look after yourself first. Uh, however, if you do follow, uh, you will get regular updates from me on what I'm working on at no cost. Uh, I'm not on Twitter anymore. You can follow me at Blue Sky. And also, uh, please check out my Twitch stream on... Oh god, what days is it? Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. Um, we have a very welcoming community of cool and diverse people who love to torment me with sound alerts. Well, look, a white crow just has vitiligo. <laughs> Uh, all these links and more can be found in the description. Let me know what you thought in the comments, and especially let me know if you have any of your own experiences within Tokyo Mesh. I'll see you next time. Thank you.